It's about the restoration of our republic. We want to educate, encourage, enable the power. We stand for integrity, honesty, self-reliance, self-defense, and most importantly, no compromise on our foundational principles. This is America's Voice Now. Find America's Voice Now on Facebook and at americasvoicenow.org. Here's Michael Evans. Good morning, America. You're listening to America's Voice Now. My name is Mike Evans. I'll be your host this morning. I'm your host every morning, or at least every morning that you're listening. <laughs> And if you're not, I know it. I have my secret ways. Just like the NSA, right? I have my secret ways. Um, Thanks for joining us this morning. If you're uh, just catching up with us or if you're a brand new listener, I am always grateful and appreciative of having uh, good patriots to work with every day. Um, I want to thank our friends over at 99.3, Big Country 99 for uh, carrying AVN on their terrestrial radio broadcast. They're a good group over there. And uh, I'm very, very happy and pleased to be on there. So uh, if you're listening to us there, hoorah. You can catch our Patriot Minute that's broadcast every day there as well, which kind of gives you an overview of some things that are happening and, and incites you to take some action. You know, if we don't take action, ladies and gentlemen, we're no better than the folks that are actually doing the criminal activities that they're doing to us. Um, it's important that each of us is, you know, active and participating in fighting back, because if we're not fighting back, then we're part of the problem, not part of the solution. If you would like, you may call into the show today. Um, I'm going to have a, a guest on in the second, uh, second segment, and so that segment, I won't be taking calls. But if you'd like to call in live today, you can at 417-204-5141. 417 417- Two zero four fifty one forty one. 541 We also have a hotline or a listen line that you can dial and listen to the show 24 hours a day, seven days a week, anytime at your leisure, your timetable. The cool part of this is that it costs you nothing to call, and if you use your NSA-sponsored personal tracking device and you've got unlimited minutes there, uh, you can utilize that anytime, anywhere, any place. Um, if you have, uh, if you don't have that, and you've got a long distance uh, service at home that is, you know, unlimited, then you can dial in at no charge and listen to the entire program. You can call four one five three two five zero seven two five. That's four one five three two five zero seven two five. That number is sponsored by a company called Audio Now that provides it to you as a listener free of charge, and. Um, Basically, we have a lot of folks that like to listen to AVN, and they're either not in our terrestrial broadcast area, the show's not on at a time when they're available to listen, uh, or they don't have Internet access. And so by dialing that listen line, you hear a brief uh, you know, answer email, or vo- um, recording that says, you know, welcome to America's Voice Now, and the show begins. And how cool is that? You can listen to the entire program. And if you, it, it doesn't matter when you call in. It doesn't matter how many other people are listening. You get your own personal play. Of, uh, of that day's episode. So, um, man, take advantage of that number. It's a great way for you to jump in and listen if you're on a long ride, if you're a truck driver and you want to be able to uh, you know, listen to great talk radio, that's the way to do it. We're going to have four different segments this morning uh, that we're going to cover. And the first segment is going to be Ruger and Smith and & Wesson. Now, they've elected to leave California uh, because California has instituted a new regulation on firearms uh, ownership and manufacturing and basically every gun maker now if they want to sell a gun in california has to do something called micro stamping and what that means is this is such an idiot ridiculous thing the firing pin has to leave a specific mark that is like a fingerprint on every shell so that gun essentially has a fingerprint well we're going to get into why it doesn't work in a minute but Suffice it to say, basically, what's happening is they've determined that there is absolutely no point in uh, being in trying to sell guns in that in that marketplace. So Ruger and Smith and Wesson have essentially made the clear made it clear they're going to leave California in their cordite smoke or their dust, depending upon how you want to look at it. And uh, I, for one, 
think that that's good that gun makers are standing up and saying we're having none of that. Maybe the folks in California will get to the point where they'll begin to recognize that they are being used and abused. Our second topic is going to be fallout from the Kelly Thomas murder. Now, I've asked Mary Jo, who is, um, she authored an article, which I posted up yesterday on America's Voice Now, where these people in Fullerton, California, are protesting the fact that Kelly Thomas was murdered and these police got off. It, you've heard me talk about this before, perhaps, but if, if um, you watch the video, there's no way anyone who is intellectually honest or um, objective can say that this was not murder. I mean, flat-out, hardcore, cold-blooded murder. And yet, these two cops walked. The community is up in arms. Everybody recognizes that it was murder, except the judge and the jury. And there's some questions about the jury. Mary Jo lives in that area, and she's been gracious enough to agree to call in this morning and give us an update on this, because the police are treating the protesters like they are like they are insurgents in Afghanistan or Iraq. It's, un, it's disgraceful. So I wanted you to be aware of that. We're going to bring it up and, 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 and uh, hit it in our second sub- subject this morning. Our third topic, freedom fighters are under attack by tyrants who are abusing their police power. What do I mean by that? Well, let's start with the idea that, one, the activist James O'Keefe has been subpoenaed uh, it, by, by uh, Governor Cuomo, the tyrant dictator fascist in New York, the governor of New York, who says there's no room for conservatives, there's no room for pro-life people, there's no room for constitutionalists, and there's no room for anybody who disagrees with his policies about gay, uh, gay marriage and gay lifestyle and or pro-life or, 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 uh, or you know, abortion or guns or any of that stuff. Now he's, he's subpoenaing James O'Keefe. Now, O'Keefe is the guy who broke the story about Acorn by uh, getting, going in there with a, um, a hidden camera, and he's broke repeatedly, story after story after story after story as a citizen journalist. And um, now they're attacking him. And then also Dinesh D'Souza has been indicted as an, on an enemies list against Obama, He's the guy who made the highly successful but very controversial film, 2016, Obama's America. Now, they've indicted him for violating campaign finance law. And again, most people who are looking at this in an objective viewpoint say, this is nothing but sheer terrorist enemies list terrorism sponsored by Obama and the federal government in an attempt to try to hurt this guy for damaging Obama. Our fourth and final topic this morning will be the enemies list is being built by a system called Main Core. Now, if you haven't heard about this before, we're going to talk a little bit about it. There's an article that's been posted up uh, on on, uh, Mr. Conservative, among other places. Basically, the government has been compiling this list of enemies and their names since the 1980s. There are an estimated 8 million people on the list. Ladies and gentlemen, that is almost 3% of the American population. That is frightening. And they know exactly where they are. They know exactly how to get at them. They track them physically and electronically. We're in trouble, people. All right, let's grab our first topic and run with it before we get there. Thank you to Jason Henry, the law offices of Jason Henry on Court Square in West Plains, 417-256-4100. Does a great job handling federal, criminal, and civil cases. Does family law uh, and uh, personal injury uh, cases relating to automobiles. Um, Excellent attorney, good guy, uh, 417-256-4100. Our friends over at Patriot Cigar and Tobacco, 417-257-1776. You can find them on Facebook by searching for Patriot Cigar and Tobacco. Also, Wits End Classic Barbershop. Jason uh, Whittingham is a friend of mine, and he's witty enough to use his own last name and call the place Wits End. And um, great barber, does my hair about once every 10 days or what little bit I got left. So I'm an easy haircut for him. <laughs> he only charges 10 bucks, folks. Does a great job. Really nice young man. Good patriot. 
uh, also on the square in West Plains. Make sure you swing in there, and when you get in there, say, you know, that guy Mike from America's Voice sent me over here, and I appreciate your supporting him. Our friends over at uh, Pizza Hut over on Porter Wagoner Boulevard in West Plains, make sure that you swing in there for a lunch break. And uh, 11 to 2, they have a great uh, pizza and uh, pasta bar as well as a salad bar. Outstanding Tuesday nights, family night, kids under 12 eat free. And then finally, of course, the battery station. Our friends over there um, who, man, what a great store and what great patriots. Visit their website at batterystation.com and call them at 417-257-7799. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, here's the deal. Smith & Wesson has, and Ruger, by the way, have determined that they can no longer attempt to work within the state of California. California has instituted a system which is call uh, which is called micro stamping and micro stamping requires that every gun maker produce a gun that has a specific fingerprint if you will so that when that firing pin strikes the the bullet casing and the primer it will leave a fingerprint that labels it as coming from that gun now of course their arguments and their claims are that you know they can solve crime with this by picking up the casings off the street and they'll be able to tie that back to gun A, B, or C. It's nonsense. It's a scam. It doesn't work. I can tell you in two seconds, and I'm going to tell you, if you live in California and you have a micro-stamped gun, here's what you do. One, go out and replace the firing pin. Case closed. <laughs> Problem solved. Number two, if you, if you don't, uh, if you don't want to order a new firing pin, simply score the one you have. Ruins the fingerprint, worthless system. But because Sturm Ruger and Smith & Wesson would have to manufacture guns specially for California, and they're already doing so for Connecticut and New York and all these other idiot states, they've just had enough and said, you know what, that's it. We're just not going to sell any semi-automatic pistols anymore. If you want to buy them in California, we can't help you. You're going to have to buy somebody else's product. And I think it's about time that we saw this kind of pushback from gun makers in the United States. You see, it's not just their livelihood that they're defending when they do this. Although, and and by all means, they have the right to be capitalists too and to do what's best in in light of who they are as a company and what's, you know, what's going to solve their bottom line, right? But more importantly, any time a government wants to strip you of your ability to defend yourself and we see the type of targeting of an enemies list like is the developing in the United States and and as we become a fascist dictatorship. And mark my words, there's no denying where we are, ladies and gentlemen. Anyone who denies it at this point is either in on it or wholly blind. That's it. There's no other alternative. It's time for America to choose sides and say, I'm no longer going to sit on the fence. I'm either going to get off on this side or I'm getting off on that side. And when you see the type of government-sponsored terrorism that is being implemented across the country on Americans, you got to recognize this for what it is. Anytime a government wants to strip you of your right to be able to, one, defend yourself and or your family, or two, be able to defend your state and your nation against tyranny, when the tyranny is so obvious that Helen Keller and Stevie Wonder can see it and describe it, then you got to recognize exactly how far down the rabbit hole we've fallen. Every country that ever slides into a totalitarianistic system, irrespective of what label you want to give it, does the same thing. First, they begin to work at removing firearms legislatively, or they ban them, or they, they um, work to create a registration list. And simultaneously, they attack every front all at the same time. They try to limit ammunition access. They try to limit or, or uh, limit your ability to purchase it by taxing it exorbitantly and things like that. That's where we are, people. Don't you smell it? I mean, at this point, you can't say that I smell smoke. Because the fire is so hot, it's licking at your butt. There is no way that you can sit here and tell me you don't see what's happening in our nation. And anyone who doesn't see it is either in on it or they participate in it because there's something in it for them. Or the alternative is 
they are the, that group of people that pretend that they're, none of this is happening because acknowledging its existence means that they then have to take some corrective action. Or they're in agreement with it. And there are plenty of those. I mean, perfect example. New York and California are loaded with them. How, how else is it that these states move in these types of circles? Connecticut, New York, California. These states, Maryland, uh, Massachusetts. These states, Colorado. They're moving in a way in which they know, and they're winning. They know that government, big government, is becoming oppressive. And either they're in on it and they like it, or there's something in it for them, or it serves their own purposes, or they're the low-information people that don't pay any attention to what's going on. They're more interested in, you know, Duck Dynasty or Kim Kardashian. I don't have a problem with Duck Dynasty. I've never watched it, I so I can't have a problem with it. I've never even seen it. All I know is some guy with a beard and camo. That's all I know. I'll tell you why I don't watch it. Because I don't allow that kind of disruption in my life. And I will not allow myself to be manipulated by a media system that is intent on distracting you from the fall of freedom and liberty. And mark my words, folks, what's happening here is that the the system is being designed right now so that you won't notice what's going on. The media is in on it, or they'd be explaining it to you. The media has either been compromised or, and, and there's individuals who try in the, in, the, in, the, in the mainstream media ministry of propaganda, but very few. But the head honchos who run these massive organizations, they direct and focus the attention away from what's happening. Now, you know, they'll occasionally talk about the story where they'll have a representative or a senator or somebody who comes on and says, you know, Obama's acting lawlessly. But you see, in all other instances where we've had massive change in the United States of America, it came about in large part because the press was the one who screamed the rally cry. And in this case, they won't. They won't because they've been told to shut up or they've been bought off or they've been threatened or coerced, or what have you. I mean, the other day, Greta Van Zustern came out and said that one of their top reporters, and she's a true news reporter, she's no psychophant, has been, they threatened her job for exposing issues about the Obama administration. Now, why Greta took so long to come out with that news, I don't know. And I don't even care. But the simple truth is this. We are seeing pressure from all sides to silence dissent, to silence freedom, free speech, liberty, it's coming from all over the place. We're seeing it from the entrenched government. We're seeing it from those people who seek to only grow their own influence and power within literally thousands of administrative agencies which operate extra-constitutionally. There's no constitutional authorization for any of them except for two, Commerce and Border Patrol. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. Those are the only two powers delegated to the federal government that require an administrative agency. Everybody else, EPA, FAA, FCC, ATF, FBI, not a single one of them has a constitutional justification to exist. Not one. This crap you're putting up with on the NSA and the spying and all that, there's no constitutional authority for it. You did not permit and give your representative, your alleged representative, the permission to take the limited power of authority you gave to him or her and then subdelegate it to a myriad group of, of minions of, of these administrative agencies who, by the way, none of them, none of them, except for the law enforcement ones, take an oath of office. Did you know that? Did you know that the National Park Service, that all of these, the EPA, none of these people take an oath of office? So... Where's their allegiance? They don't have to have an allegiance to you. They're not even violating an oath. Same thing in these states. That's why you've got states like California who pass these egregious firearms acts because they don't have an allegiance to freedom and liberty. It's that simple. The truth of the matter is 
Ruger and Smith and Wesson and every other company, every other gun manufacturer in the nation should simply say, we're not going to play. That's it. We're boycotting the state. Not because the individuals and the citizens in the state have done anything wrong, but because the state legislative entries or, or, or entities have. And for, even more importantly, the citizens in the state won't stop it. They are the power. You know, I'd love to see the gun manufacturers in this country get together and take out national ads that say, L- ladies and gentlemen, this is your nation. And you are standing there on, you know, you're, you're the power, you're the weight, but you refuse to acknowledge. You're like a herd of elephants, and you're all standing there, and you're afraid of one little mouse. 300 million of you, and you're cowering from one mouse. It's ridiculous. You could stomp the thing into a grease spot on the ground. If all you do is just take that one big old flat foot and go... Ladies and gentlemen, it's our country. We're either going to take it back or we're going to lose it. And if you don't wake up and take action soon, then honestly, the day you do wake up, you're going to wake and find yourself in chains, being beaten savagely while you're raped and you're robbed and you're stolen from and you are helpless to resist. There is no other alternative, people. This has gone too far. This has gone too far. We've got two minutes left. We're going to take a break. Before we go there, I, you know, I've got to tell you, I, I, I routinely try to get people to recognize and understand where, you know, how far down the rabbit hole we've fallen here. And for the life of me, I cannot understand why people refuse to recognize the danger we're in because it's no longer a question of you know should we fight back how do we fight back i don't even care at this stage in the game it's almost anything goes why do i say that because you got to look at at what's happening to us when we've got enemies lists that our government is sponsoring and they are going after individuals do you remember the old statement from Neil Mueller who said you know, first they came for the un- trade unionists, and I wasn't a trade unionist, so I didn't do anything. And then they came for the Catholics, and I wasn't a Catholic, so I didn't do anything. Then they came for the, for the intellectuals, and I wasn't an intellectual, so I didn't do anything. By the time they came here for me, there was nobody left to do anything. I'll remind you of Winston Churchill's words. Still, if you will not fight for the right when you can easily win without bloodshed, if you will not fight when your victory will be sure and not too costly, you may come to the moment when you will have to fight with all the odds against you and only a precarious chance of survival. Indeed, there may even be a worse case. You may have to fight when there is no hope of victory because it is better to perish than live as slaves. If that doesn't put it into perspective for you folks, I don't know what will. We're there. Hello. Country's coming apart at the seams. We're there. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. You're listening to America's Voice now. When we come back, we're going to talk about the Kelly Thomas murder. I posted an article up yesterday, and and I, on there I put a um, two videos. One was the uh, video of the actual Kelly Thomas murder, the entire half hour that was recorded by uh, city surveillance cameras, and then a video that I had done a, on on a segment uh, I don't know a week or so ago, and. Um, there was a, an article posted up there by Mary Jo, who is a friend of mine and uh, also a, a, a writer and an author and an activist. 
And Mary, as I call her, um, has uh, written this article because what's going on uh, over there is really unbelievable. The citizenry and the people who live in the community are up in arms about the, the murder that took place. And they're even more angry about the fact that a jury acquitted these two murderers. Now, nobody can watch this half-hour video and say this guy wasn't murdered. And these people are out there, and they are, they are essentially um, protesting the fact that these, this, uh, these two cops got off. And I, I got to tell you, I, I've asked Mary to give us a call this morning and bring us up to speed on what's transpiring because she lives in that area and she has been witness to uh, and following this from its very inception. I mean, she's been going to the to the hearings and, and uh, you know, monitoring court dates and listening to the specifics and so forth and so on. So, Mary, uh, you're with us. Thanks very much for calling. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, so can you do me a favor and kind of first of all, you know, you're a, you're a strong activist and I appreciate what you do out there all the time. Can you give us a little bit of an overview first on, on what your involvement is or what your knowledge and, and insight is to this issue? Um, well, I've been in the uh, beginning, since the beginning in uh, July the 5th, 2011. Yeah. Um, he was um, accused, Kelly was accused of uh, pulling on door handles in a parking lot of the Slide Bar Cafe. Um, which was false. He was not. He was looking for cigarette butts. Um, and he really was, he wasn't doing anything. He, you know, he was just wandering around. Um, the cops were called, and they did total overkill on him. Um, it was a televised murder, and they just started, you know, hammering away. And like you said, they were just toying with him. Yeah. And then we, we were protesting in the streets every Saturday, um, after that, until the end of um, the end of 2011, I believe it was. Um, but the DA felt so much pressure from that that it was thought he w- he felt enough pressure to um, press charges on the on these cops because normally the history of the DA is he doesn't press charges against cops in Orange County, right? Which is notorious for a lot of you know, police brutality going on against the citizenry. Oh, yeah. Now, in, in this instance, he pressed these charges, but it, it almost kind of appeared like he did it half-heartedly, like he did it just to, oh, yeah. you know, make it make the public mollified to the idea that, okay, I'm going to do something about it. But he didn't really, oh, truly pursue oh, it. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. Like I said, it was, it was because of public outcry, because we were um, protesting in front of the Fullerton Police Department every Saturday. Right. And sometimes in front of the DA's building, too. But one of the things that, that you had reiterated in your article here um, was that, you know, people were going there and they were protesting and they were holding up signs. And then they started to have problems where the police were, you know, wearing riot gear. They were ordering people to disperse. And when they didn't move quick enough, they were grabbing them off the street and throwing them into paddy wagons. And then, you know, there were incidents where they were actually threatening people and things like that. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Um, Yeah, there was one. I went to um, a council meeting in Fullerton on Tuesday night, and one young man struck me, Adam. He actually said that he was thrown into a paddy wagon is what he called it, um, the jail on the wheel type right. of thing. And that's when um, the cops leaned into him and, and said that um, there was 12 cops waiting to smash his face, their, his face in, his yeah. head face in. Um, he was being very honest. There was other, uh, other people that were there and who also got arrested who said, yeah, you know, I can co- collaborate that happened that actually happened it happened to me too it happened to all of us right so there were more than this wasn't just his claim there were other witnesses there that corroborated his argument right right exactly um and they were they were hot they were really upset now Um, now first of all the verdict shock and then and then the way they were treated when they protested in the streets right 
Now, you, there was another there was another incident where the cops, you know, were basically taunting these people in the paddy wagon with the the phrase "not guilty," you know, kind of you know, inciting them to, I guess, hopefully do something stupid so that they could, you know, <laughs> commit right, some more exactly. mayhem. I guess I don't know, you know. Yeah, exactly. Um, at, at this stage in the game, and and I mean. Now at this at this point, and I read an article the other day that one of these guys actually tried to get his is trying to get his job back. Which I mean, I can't believe that the citizens of Fullerton would allow this guy to be a cop again in their midst. Um, oh, oh, absolutely not. Well, so so what is happening with that aspect of it? Well, um, the uh, police, the new police chief Dan Hughes. He was at the meeting, and he said that there's new hiring practices that he's put in force, like they're not going to hire laterals, and meaning, you know, if they work for another police department, they're not going to just pull them over like they used to. Uh, they have to gr- be a graduate um, of the police academy before they hire them. They're going to do background checks on the police officers before they hire them. Frankly, I'd like to see psychiatric tests on a lot of these cops that are out there because yeah, it almost looks right. like they're hiring these psychopaths for, you know. Um, well, it was because of the, it was the old way. I mean, there was a police chief, um, Pat McKinley. He hired that one-eyed cop. He, he was the one that, he was one of the ones that was on trial. Yeah. Um, and he hired him and he was shot, this, this cop was shot in the head and, and in the back and you know there had to be some kind of brain damage for him to be uh, losing an eye um, he actually lost an eye Pat McKinley hired him off of the LAPD because mm-hmm. the LAPD said he was fired right um, but he uh, and they he, and Pat McKinley gave him patrol keys and uh, all kinds of stuff I mean there's a reason why you need two eyes to be a cop, right? I right. would think. Sure. Uh, definitely not driving a car. You need your peripheral vision when you drive a car. Right. Well, I mean, I, you know, you, you can't hold a, a, a disability or a handicap, especially something that he got in the line of duty against him. But on the flip side of the fence, you don't have to have him out there on patrol. I mean, there's ways that you could well, hire a police officer like that and put him, you know, make him an armorer or make him, you know, put him in doing paperwork or maybe transporting well, yeah, prisoners or something. Point. You know, but it doesn't that's, have to be, you know, on patrol. And obviously, these guys have a history of this kind of behavior. So, you know, I mean, this isn't something that was new for these two guys, right? No, it was actually encouraged, that kind of behavior, um, by the old the old uh, guard, I would I'll say. Right. The old chief of police that was there. It was actually encouraged. They were, like, they had their way of thinking. It's, there's two people. It's us, and, it's, and then there's them. Yeah. Meaning us. Well, I'm not so sure that's the old guard. I think that's actually the old guard then, and it's the new guard now. Because it seems like these incidents of police brutality and, and abuse of their police power and their their ego trip with their authority. I mean, this is nationwide now. We're seeing cases all over the place. I mean, in New Mexico, they've got some kind of a fixation with anal probing where, you know, that one guy just got a $1.6 million settlement because they they hit this guy six times based on the suspicion that he was clenching his buttocks. I mean, come on. You know, after the... One hospital even refused to uh, do it, saying it was unethical. They wouldn't do the work. And, and, you know, they yeah. gave him a, a, a x-rays and a colonoscopy. I mean, after the first or the second invasion, doesn't somebody say, hey, well, maybe there really isn't anything here to find? <laughs> I mean, six times? Exactly. And then there was I a know. woman who, uh, eight times. So, I mean, we're seeing this all over the place. We're seeing constant sources of police abuse, which is one of the reasons why they fight so hard against this citizens having cameras issue. Tell me a little bit about your, the, the Fullerton city and the situation as it stands right now. Are you folks well, still, I mean, are there still protests going on? Are they demanding? I mean, there's been talk about a federal uh, Department of Justice look, which I don't hold any real faith in, but tell us I about that. I very strongly that the protests are going to stop. They're going to keep on doing that. Uh, there was a lot of verdict shock because um, it was totally 
everybody thinks it's unfair, 100%. I don't think there was one person who didn't think the verdict was unfair. Uh, how does the city the feel... House was packed. How does the city feel like they're going to have the credibility anymore to be in- interactive and integral with the community when the community, so it, you know, it's so obvious to the community that this was a cover-up, you know, from the top to the very bottom? Well, I think it's because they changed the uh, chief of police and he's changing things around a little bit, or so he says. Uh, we'll see. Time will tell. But he's, say, he's saying that um, things are going to change, and he's changing things, and he, he made a vow that to stick by his original firing of those two cops, or three cops, I think he fired. Right. Um, he's, he's standing by that. Um, now, for the, the record... Ca- there was. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Go ahead. There was three city council people who sat on there um, before the ones that are now on there, and um, during the time of the Kelly Thomas murder, and um, they were just apathetic. They just didn't do, and they got recalled. So there's a whole there's a whole new uh, gang of people up there. Right. At, at this stage in the game, um, there were six cops that were involved in this murder, and you know, I mean, I, you could clearly see that four of them were Johnny Come Latelys to the event. The first two were, you know. We're literally just beating the snuff, the, the stuffing out of this poor guy before the other four got there. But once they got there, I mean, you could clearly see that, you know, six grown men, you know, sitting on this guy. And, and you know, I mean, it was it was ridiculous. Um, what happened to the other four guys? I mean, you said three were fired. What about the other three? Are they still on the force? Yeah, nobody pressed any charges. We're everybody's really angry about that, too. They still have their jobs. There's. Yeah. I mean, how how would um, how would you feel if that partic- one of those particular guys, you know, knocked on your door or pulled you over? I don't know about you, but I, you know, if you if you knew that that was horrible. the cop who was about to pull you over, I don't. I'm not sure I would pull over. <laughs> I think I'd rather. <laughs> I think I'd rather drive to the nearest police station or something, and and made sure that there were witnesses there or something, or make sure you know it was in a it was in a park a crowded parking lot or something. I. I I would be afraid. Well, that's part of the protesting, too. Um, they always protest about that. And uh, a friend of mine also heard that um, the DA wasn't going to press charges on one of them, but I think he was fired anyway um, and was livid, just livid about it. Uh, so they get away scot-free, basically. So you don't you don't see the federal the federal uh, uh, charges being pressed against these two or the the sixth, frankly. Well, I do see um, FBI coming in um, and them pressing charges on three of them. I do see that. I hear about that anyway, and that uh, Fullerton PD is going to fully um, cooperate with them. So I am hearing little snippets about that happening. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I doubt very, very clearly that those other four or three are going to be um, prosecuted in any kind of way. Well, they weren't really even disciplined, though, right? I mean, we're not. I mean, no, uh-uh. prosecution is one thing. These guys weren't even disciplined. There was no, no, nope, nope, nothing. No reprimand and, and nothing put nothing. in their quote permanent file. <laughs> None of that, right? Well, I don't, I don't know. We don't have privy to that. You know, we have the uh, police bill of rights here in. Uh, what you call California? Yeah, um, sorry. <laughs> I know you live no, there, but that's true. you know the rest it's of us true. look at California and we're like, "What the heck is going on there?" That's not even the same yeah, country we live in. <laughs> no, I have to shake my head too. It, it's just unreal. You know, um, there's an old it, phrase that I don't know if Californians use it or not, but everywhere else in the country, it's, there's an old phrase that you know, "As goes California, so goes the nation." And when yeah. when the rest of us hear that, we're like. Heck no. <laughs> you know, I don't know, even well, start. California is crazy. California is just a crazy place to live. And yet I know, a lot of, I know a lot of people in Northern California that, you know, are completely the opposite. I mean, and of course, you know, you've got the, the Jefferson movement out there, you know, to separate the state and split it up. But I know a lot of Northern Californians that, you know, are completely different than the people that are, you know, in the southern half of the state or anything well, north there's of... A lot of... there's a lot of little pockets within California um, that are probably old school, 
um, it just depends on where you are, where you go right. in California. Some are more uh, liberal than others, but you know, on the on the whole, I think it, um, California is known as a liberal state. Yeah, but well, there, there are little pockets that are more conservative than others. Well, you know, I'm sure there were pockets in in Soviet Russia and in uh, Mao's China and and c- exactly. current China too. But right, but help. but right. I mean, how do, how is it that you fight a beast that's that big? You know, you can't. I mean, it really yeah. is. Um, it, it's frightening. If I were a citizen living there today, and I were in I were in Fullerton, California, I would mm-hmm. I would not be willing to pull my vehicle over at a, at a police light. You know, behind me. I'm telling you right now. No, it's- no, I, I know. These people are scared. They're scared to death. You should have heard in the trial, in the, um, I'm sorry, in the council meeting. People are scared. They don't know what to do. What can you, what can they do? What kind of localized ideas have they come up with? Where, where's the sheriff in your county? Um, Sandra Hutchins, she's, um, she's a liberal, basically. Oh, brother. I know. So, so not, th- I don't. I wouldn't count on her to help. Th- that's like that's like Robin Hood asking the sheriff of Nottingham for help. <laughs> <laughs> right, there you go. You know, <laughs> I, I, w- I wouldn't count on her to help. I got gotcha. you. Uh, and 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 the uh, as far I'm just really concerned about this Kelly Thomas trial too, and the DA and and the whole um, uh, corruptness of of the, of the legal system because the uh, the trial for the jury foreman was an ex employee of the DA who also prosecuted the case. Now, how did the courts allow that? Because that's such a conflict of interest. That would disqualify any juror. How did the defense not stop that? I don't know. That's why I have questions. And he's a defense lawyer as well. Oh, my goodness. Not only is he an ex-employee of this DA, of the same DA, the same guy who prosecuted the case, he's a lawyer. And he there's like 330 people in Santa Ana yeah. His name got drawn for jury duty out of all those people. Seventy percent are over eighteen too. And his name happened to get drawn for jury duty and he happened to wind up on the Kelly Thomas trial. Yeah, what are the odds of that? Mm-hmm. You got a better chance of winning the lottery twice in the same day. Right. <laughs> I would think so. You know, because it's and it's funny I spoke to everybody I spoke to wasn't called for the Kelly, Kelly Thomas trial. You know, it's, I don't know what your state law is related to this issue, but I recently got a jury duty summons, and I called over there because I have a felony in my history, and I said to them, are you going to allow me to sit on a jury? In other words, am I wasting my time going down there for the day? And she said, yes, you are. We will not let you sit on a jury. And I'm thinking to myself, now, wait a minute. I'm probably the most objective person that you, got, you could pick out of that group, but they don't care. They don't want a felon sitting on a jury because they assume you're automatically going to you know, to cheer for the for the, the the criminal side. I mean, it's ridiculous. I don't know anybody more objective than me and, and or more knowledgeable about the system than me. And that's the other reason they don't want felons sitting on juries, because you know too much about how the system works and how corrupt it is. And they don't want people like that to be able to say, well, wait a second, let's see that evidence again. And how did you come up with that? And where did you get it? And, you know, question it. Well, I would think a, a lawyer would also you know know the system yeah but if he's part of the if he's part and parcel of the game and he's the foreman of the jury he's going to make it go one way or the way that they tell him to go or the way he wants it to go right that's right i mean it's unconscionable that the fact that he got chose for this jury too the da and the prosecution they both have to agree to it and they agreed to have him on there i can't and the judge does too I mean, did, did it look to you like the the, like the the attorney for Thomas's family or or the prosecutor was in in league with this thing? Or I mean, was the you know was the trial itself a sham or what? It seemed to me because he didn't object the the the, the, the DA the prosecutor. Yeah. He did not. He did not object really hard to anything that the defense was saying, and they and defense was saying some nutty stuff. And it's unconscionable. And a, a, accusing Kelly of all kinds of crap 20 years ago. Right. As if that had anything to do with the fact that he's now dead. Well, but plus, he's, he's, the, he's the victim. Right. That's Why what I mean. Trial? That's what I mean. I mean, how do you accuse... You know, that's like sitting there and, and, and 
Of course, we see that in the justice system all the time, right? You know, especially yeah. uh, where you've got, you know, women who are raped and things like that, where they try to make it look as if, you know, well, they asked for it or, you know, that kind of thing. Or uh, any kind of a victim now, you know, the, the victim is the one who becomes the one on trial, not the, not the actual perpetrator of the event. I don't know how anyone could watch what that video. What also, well, there's an other videos, too, that, and they weren't called into, um, they weren't entered. There's a bus surveillance tape, actually, where you can hear witnesses um, who saw the beating on, on the bus because it, it took place at a bus stop, a bus station that's right next to that um, slide bar cafe. Right. And the people on the bus actually saw it, and it was captured on audio video. And you have that tape, and that was not entered in by the by the prosecution or any of those witnesses were, were not called. None of them. Utter, utter ridiculousness. What a sham, and what a shame. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you very much. We're down to about a, a two minutes. I want to thank you very much oh, okay. for taking the time to call in here. I know you live in California. I mean, California. Oh. And <laughs> I know that this is early in the morning for you, and it's probably pre-coffee window. Oh, so that's fine. Thanks That's so much fine. for calling in, and thanks so much for, uh, you know, the submission of that story and that article. And, you know, if, as you write more, we'll certainly, keep, we'll certainly keep this issue in the forefront of America's eyes. And the reason for it is, is not necessarily uh, so much that it, it gives us pause f- or, or cause for outrage, although it should and it does. But more importantly, it makes America aware that right. not only is this happening you know, in, in a place like California, but the next time they see something happen in their own community that's wrong, then, you know, right. they'll recognize it for what it is, right? Yeah, speak out, speak out. You got it. America, arise and be counted. Be fearless and fierce and courageous and speak even when your voice shakes and trembles with fear. And there was a lot of shaky voices in that meeting, but they spoke. I'm proud of that. That's great. Thanks so much, Mary. You have a great day. I appreciate you. you calling in. Anytime. All right. Thank have, you. have a great day. Folks, that was Mary Jo. Uh, she is, um, you know, she's, I, I'm not quite even sure how she found AVN, but um, uh, she is a, a loyal listener and um, constantly comments and, and, and posts things up for us on our Facebook page and, uh, and on our website. And uh, she writes for not only AVN, but uh, DC Clothesline, where some of this stuff was originally published as well. DC Clothesline, ladies and gentlemen, is an outstanding website. It's dcclothesline.com. And I encourage you to go out there and, um, and, and visit that site. Uh, they're very similar to what we do in the sense of, you know, posting up all this alternative media that the Ministry of Propaganda is keeping hidden from you. So um, do yourself a favor, visit the D.C. clothes line, or it's just plain D.C., like District of Columbia, clothes line, like a clothes line you would hang your clothing on out in the yard, and um, dcclothesline.com. Dean Garrison is the uh, purveyor of that, and uh, he is uh, a guy who just got sick and tired of watching what was going on, similar to me, and said, you know what, since nobody else is going to speak, I guess I have to. (laughs) So essentially, our uh, same thing with, with me. Um, okay, you've been listening to America's Voice. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to be talking about the enemy list under attack. Um, Dinesh D'Souza has been indicted uh, for a crime which uh, really isn't a crime, and um, we've also we're seeing a lot of pressure uh, from the the uh, on the conservatives in the nation. Mr. O'Keefe has uh, been targeted by uh, Governor Cuomo, the fascist in New York. We're going to talk a little bit about both those circumstances. Make sure that you visit our friends over at BatteryStation.com, 417-257-7799, and our friends at Pizza Hut on Porter Wagoner Boulevard, uh, every day lunch uh, special. Jason Henry at the, uh, on Court Square in West Plains, 417-256-4100. Our friends at Patriot Cigar and Tobacco Shop, 417-257-1776, and Wits End Classic Barber Shop in West Plains. We're going to take a quick break. When we return, we'll tackle these, uh, the, these topics here. Make sure that you get a chance to um, visit our website and uh, read that latest post that uh, Mary Jo wrote. I, I see there's two pictures that have got broken links in there. I'll fix those before, the, uh, before lunch today. And um, uh, share that story with your friends so that America is aware of what's happening. We'll be right back.
It's about the restoration of our republic. We want to educate, encourage, enable the power. We stand for integrity, honesty, self-reliance, self-defense, and most importantly, no compromise on our foundational principles. This is America's Voice Now. Find America's Voice Now on Facebook and at americasvoicenow.org. Here's Michael Evans. Good morning, America. You're listening to America's Voice right now, right here. You know, um, we're in our third segment this morning, if, um, if you're just joining us. And uh, we want to thank those folks who jump on and catch our, our show live every morning on America's Voice Now. Uh, I can see some folks out there in uh, Ligonor Bartonsville. Hmm. I think that looks like somewhere in Pennsylvania or something. Uh, Chesterfield, not quite sure where that is. Richardson, looks like Richardson, Texas. And uh, Mission Viejo and some other locations. I see uh, Seattle up there. And... Um, I encourage folks to uh, catch our show live on uh, americasvoicenow.org where they can uh, catch it in either audio or video. If you don't like my mug, that's fine. You can catch it just on audio. And um, uh, the goal, of course, is to have you share that information and education that you're gaining by working with us and, you know, share it with other people who are still asleep at the switch, folks, because we're in big trouble as a nation. This segment, we're going to talk about an enemy list that is being compiled and assaulted by the progressive liberal me- or, or media and also the activists in the country. There's two articles out today, and both of them are up on our website, Facebook and Patriot Facebook and, and you know all of the rest of the media that we hit. And essentially, the conservative uh, activist group, which is run by James O'Keefe, is being targeted by Governor uh, Cuomo's administration. Now, O'Keefe runs the group called Project Veritas, and this is the group that put together the hidden camera um, investigations that broke open ACORN, if you recall, that exposed ACORN for what it was and actually caused ACORN's demise. In addition to that, he recently uh, was responsible for uh, breaking open the issue in te- in uh, Texas, where that guy was um, working as a uh, a navigator for Obamacare and was accused of buying and selling private uh, lists of of individuals and so forth and so on. Anyway, uh, Project Veritas and O'Keefe, James O'Keefe, are are um, at war, essentially, and. O'Keefe came out against Cuomo after he blasted, you know, the people who are right to life, the pro-assault weapon and anti-gay crowd, and, and, and told the, the nation that they have no place in New York. Now, I've called, and I'm calling for, not only his removal from office, but his impeachment and criminal charges against him because he has come out, and by a statement like that, clearly stated that he no longer represents any of those people within his state. And as a sworn uh, governor of the state of New York, he has a legal obligation, not just political and moral and ethical and every other way, but a legal obligation to represent fairly everyone in that state. He has violated that. And furthermore, he is doing physical emotional, financial damage to his enemies. And ladies and gentlemen, that's not cause for a recall. That's not cause for uh, pushback. That's not cause for a call to get him out on his next election. That's cause for a charge of treason because he's being traitorous to his own state, his own people that he represents or allegedly represents. Now, it's a good thing I'm not in New York, because if I was in New York, the odds are very, very good that they'd be kicking in my front door. Cuomo clearly is a fascist, and there is no disguising it. There is no other way to walk. I mean, I know he tried to walk his remarks back when the public backlash came out. And you've heard that guys like, like Sean Hannity have announced they're leaving the state. They've had enough. 
You want to be like that? I'm taking my money. I'm selling my property. I'm closing my businesses in New York, and I'm moving to another place. Now, of course, you've also seen, and uh, well, maybe you haven't unless you're in my area, but I live in Missouri, and I can tell you that at least once per night, and the only thing I watch on television is news, and not because I fall for their propaganda, but because I listen to what the guests are saying, and I use it as fodder for our show here. And every night, and I, listen, I, I watch uh, Fox, and I watch Communist News Network, and MSLSD, and you know all of them, ABC, CBS, ABC. Every night, I see at least one time a commercial that says, come to New York and open a business, and we'll give you a tax break for the first 10 years you're in business here in New York. In other words, they are running ad campaigns to try to encourage people to move to New York and open a business there. And they're offering you a 10-year tax abatement window to do that. The reason is because companies are leaving New York in droves. There's an article out yesterday, uh, this morning, I'm sorry, about a baseball player. And I I don't like professional sports at all um, because I think it's a distractive and willful, intentional distraction for Americans. I think it's the way to control the testosterone flow of 100 million burly men who might just actually turn around and go take Washington out if uh, they didn't have some other way to, ex- to expel their, their uh, energies. But the, this guy uh, was just awarded a contract for like $155 million for a baseball pitcher. I don't even know his name, and I don't care. The point is... His taxes, ladies and gentlemen, are 56% of the total value of the contract over a seven-year period. In other words, his taxes amount, I think it was $90 million. And because he stayed in New York and didn't take two other team offers, he would have saved, by going to either of the other two teams, $12 million. Now, when you talk about $12 million bucks, and you're talking about a $12 million difference between being in New York and being somewhere else in the country, you got to recognize that this thing is so far out of control in the state of New York. I don't know how anybody can afford to live there anymore. The state and city taxes are so outrageous. Look, Cuomo is a fascist, and his statement speaks far louder than anything else he can try to say and walk back later. Now, O'Keefe is claiming that that Cuomo's thugs are are acting on his words because it's revealed that the department of labor went to his office in westchester county new york and they demanded financial documents going back months and he's comparing it to the irs that's targeting the conservative you know uh uh, groups that are applying for any kind of uh tax tax abatement or tax exemptions here's what he says Governor Cuomo's shocking words this week aren't simply words. Governor Cuomo and the New York State Department of Labor are on a witch hunt, demanding all documents and financials since our founding. His goal, of course, is to harass us and limit our effectiveness by tying us up in court. Just like President Obama used the IRS to target and suppress conservatives, Governor Cuomo is using his Department of Labor to do the same exact thing. Ladies and gentlemen, this is only the tip of the iceberg because it's announced that Dinesh D'Souza, also today, has, um, he's the guy who created that uh, 2016 Obama's America movie. Now, this is the most successful political documentary that's ever been made, commercially successful. It's earned, I think, 20, $33 million or something like that. And the... Guy has been indicted now in New York, of course in New York, right, on charges that he violated campaign finance law because he helped uh, gather and collect money for a, a political campaign. And basically, the, uh, they're saying that he directed 20000 in illegal contributions to be made to a New York Senate race that ran against Hillary Clinton's U.S. Senate, that ran for Hillary Clinton's U.S. Senate seat when she took the Department of State role. The, the uh, campaign was for a, a woman by the name of Wendy Long. 
Now, D'Souza, first of all, is, is using the defense that, hey, I just bundled campaign donations just like all of Obama's uh, campaign uh, bundlers. In fact, for the record, by the way, the, um, the campaign f- uh, bundler for Obama uh, was one of his little boy toys. This guy just got announced as the ambassador to Norway. And when he was asked a basic question about Norway, he fumbled it so bad, he didn't even know who the political parties were in power. It would be like a guy being announced as the, you know, who's going to be the ambassador here from Japan or Norway, who doesn't know that there, what, who doesn't know that there's really only a Republican and Democrat party. (laughs) It's ridiculous. Norway, their major newspaper, their New York Times, Wall Street journalist type paper, actually put a statement out that said, this is embarrassing. The guy doesn't know the first thing about Norway. He may not even know how to spell the country's name. So what's he doing becoming the ambassador? I mean, it was, he, it's not that he's qualified to be the ambassador. He just bundled a bunch of donations for Obama. Half a million to be exact, by the way. So D'Souza is now being investigated for doing exactly what all of Obama's cronies have done. These are the same people who got the Solyndra grants and the money and all of this. And in mid in mid twenty thirteen, months after after the uh, the uh, documentary earned some thirty three million dollars in the box office, he was immediately investigated. Now, the prosecutors are saying that he's charged with causing the illegal campaign contributions to be made and then causing false statements to be made in connection. And they're saying that the criminal case resulted from a routine review by the FBI of campaign filings by various candidates. A routine review. In other words, they just did these random audits and came up with this and found dirt in this particular one. Well, Gerald Mullen, who's the co-producer of 2016, he came out and said the charges are clearly politically motivated. Just days before the indictment, he he put out an op-ed on The Blaze. And basically, here's what he said. In Michael's In Michael Moore's America... Speaking out against the president gets you a visit from the Secret Service. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? He's right. The truth is, see, as we move forward into deeper and deeper and deeper into enemy territory of fascism, we now have no cover for and no protection for our backs. We now see that our supply lines for freedom and liberty-loving Americans have been cut off, and we're on our own in a hostile environment, completely surrounded by the enemy and the enemy's uh, uh, apologists and friends and, and you know, psychophants. And as we move for- further and further and further, and, and the truth is we're not really moving into fascism like crossing into enemy territory. It's just that the fascists have moved the front past our town, past our city, past our community, and we we now find ourselves in what was our own country, but now we are surrounded by the enemy in, for all intents and purposes, hijacked property, hijacked land. We are finding ourselves embroiled as, you know, inside of an enemy camp that was our home. The question that we all have to ask ourselves is, how long before I'll be a target? Who will be next? Will it be me? Will people who are going out there doing what I'm doing, people like Mary, people like uh, uh, Dean Garrison, will we be the next targets? You know, there's that, uh, there's that uh, conservative guy from Florida. His name was um, uh, Black, and he's a black man. And he called for Obama to be, to be uh, prosecuted for treason and hung. Well, it immediately got him a visit from the Secret Service. Immediately, ladies and gentlemen. What we're looking at right now is if you're a black person or a person of minority ancestry, whether it be Hispanic or black, and you support the conservative constitutional philosophy, you're now considered an enemy by your own peers. 
if you are someone who speaks out. See, where, where we've fallen right now is we are again seeing the resurrection of the Sedition Act. Maybe not legislatively yet, but it won't be long. If you recall the Sedition Act, basically, John Adams put it in place, one of our founders, and it said that if you speak ill of the president or any of the cabinet members, that you can be charged with sedition and thrown in prison. And hundreds and hundreds of Americans were imprisoned for speaking out about you know, their dislike for the president or their dislike for the administration or whatever the case may be. That, ladies and gentlemen, was the, was the issue that incited Thomas Jefferson and James Madison to write the principles of nullification. Remember, when, what happened was they wrote these principles of nullification when they said, in our state, we're not going to honor that law. If you want to pass it in Washington, D.C., and the rest of the country wants to implement it, that's fine. But in our state, we're nullifying it because it's not a law that was passed that is, quote, pursuant to the Constitution. The Constitution says we have a right to free speech. Clearly, we, according to Washington, now we don't. See, any time your government passes a law that has no constitutional basis for existence, we are not obligated to follow it as citizens. It's not breaking the law to not adhere to it. In fact, our founders told us that laws that are made by tyrants with tyrannical intent or unconstitutional intent, which is the same thing, if it's made outside the Constitution, it only serves one master. It either serves liberty or it serves tyranny. And you're not obligated to follow a law that falls outside of constitutional authorization, justification, and foundation. End of argument, ladies and gentlemen. That's why you don't have to adhere to Obamacare. That's why you should opt out. There are a lot of practical reasons why you should opt out of Obamacare, too, not the least of which is you're leaving yourself wide open to identity theft. But more importantly, the reason that you opt out is because you and I are doing our dead level best to civilly disobediently destroy Obamacare. I want it destroyed. And you should, too. And by opting out, you are doing the one thing that you can do to starve the beast. You see, all of these laws that are passed, all of these regulations that are passed by extra-constitutional agencies, none of them have any bearing. And I can tell you, I, I foresee what's going to happen. I, this is a prediction, and, and I don't often make them, but I see what's going to happen as time moves on. It's gotten to the point where everyone is feeling like they've been pushed into a corner. At least everyone that I talk to and, and, and that is a, of a conservative or a constitutional mindset. And even those that are not, I see them increasingly coming over and saying, wow, I wasn't paying attention before, but I am now, and I can't believe what I've woken to. Or even people who have been politically aware but are now recognizing that they've stepped into a trap of their own making on the liberal progressive side. When I say that, I'm talking about it as an example in specificity. Congress people and, and senators and, and House members of the, of the Democratic and liberal persuasion who are seeing the fruits of big government now that it's spying on them, that it's taking away their free speech, that it's taking away their right to privacy, that it's costing them money, that their rights to liberty and freedom and, and to choose their own doctor and choose their own hospital is being stolen from them by the same big government that they've been promoting all this time. But now they see that once a dragon grows to maturity, you can no longer control it. You know, it's like having a tiger in your home. You get this tiger, and when you first get it, it's a kitten and it's cute, and it's cuddly, and it likes to play, but it begins to grow, and it has a nature of its own that you cannot change. And tyranny is no different. It has a nature of its own that you cannot change. 
And, you know, as this tiger begins to grow and mature, it no longer needs and relies upon you. It becomes, it becomes independent of you. And whether by choice or whether by nature or whether it just doesn't recognize it or whether it has malicious intent, it can cause you incredible damage. And at one point in time or another, that tiger who you think you've trusted because you've raised it from a kitten turns around and kills you. We see it, in, in, and that's a perfect analogy for what's going on. When you, got this, when you got this tiger, you thought it was so cute and cuddly, and as you raised it, you know, time went by, and in your mind, you're thinking, wow, this cat, you know, uh, you're, you're trying to rationalize and reason away the danger, saying, you know, this, ki- this cat is going to be my friend because it knows me and trusts me, and it, and it relies upon me for food and sustenance and protection. But at some point in time, the tiger and government grow beyond your control, grow beyond their, your, their, or your need for them to be dependent upon you. And now the tables are turned. Ladies and gentlemen, we can look at it any way you want. But the truth of the matter is, we are in a dangerous, dangerous place in our nation when we are sitting here watching conservatives who are just merely speaking out, which is a right every human being has and every American is imbued with and embedded with and implanted with from birth. Psychologically, I'm not talking about in a spiritual sense or in a, in a, uh, a historical sense. I mean, every human being has been given the gifts by our Creator that we have the the right to life and liberty and property ownership and the benefit of the fruits of our labor. But when you start to see a government that says, I'm big enough now and independent enough now to use my greater power and my greater strength against you and take away those things, the end should be clear for all to see. The question is, Are you going to sit there and try to pretend that this tiger doesn't have a a malevolent intent towards you? Are you going to sit there and try to fool yourself into thinking that all is safe, only to wake up moments before your end with his teeth wrapped around your neck? Ask any handler of dangerous animals, and they will tell you, If you turn your back on this bear, if you turn your back on that lion, on that tiger, your life isn't worth the breath you're breathing. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a tiger in our midst, and it has the taste of blood on it, and it likes it. You're listening to America's Voice now. When we come back, we're going to talk about an enemy list created by a system that called Main Corps that ought to scare the pants off of every American. If you think things are bad now, wait until you find out how they're tracking 8 million Americans, 3% of the entire national population. We'll be right back. to America's Voice Now. We're back from our last and final break of the morning. We're in our fourth and final segment today. And um, TGIF, guys. <laughs> I have been struggling all week with this um, this uh, loss of voice. And um, it's killing me. <laughs> this weekend can't come fast enough. <laughs> I don't know that I'll be better on Monday, but I hope I will be. Maybe I need a vow of silence over the weekend, huh? 
Well, actually, there's a lot of people out there that would be happy if I gave a vow of silence, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, too bad. Tough. Um, before we get crazy on this segment, uh, I want to remind you of our of our listen line. And I'd like you to share this with other folks because um, it's an important number that enables anybody to listen to AVN anytime, anywhere that, they, that uh, is convenient for them. You don't have to be at the radio or at your computer at a certain time. Uh, it works everywhere in the country. If you're using your NSA-sponsored personal tracking device and you've got unlimited minutes, uh, you can call. It doesn't cost you a penny. If you don't have a personal tracking device, good for you, and you can still use your home phone, my only suggestion is make sure that you've got unlim- an unlimited number of you know, long-distance minutes to call because it would be a long-distance call for you. It's called our listen line. The number is 415-325-0725. That's 415 415- Three two five zero seven two five, and what I'd like for you to do is write that down, and this is a great opportunity for you to share that number with other people, so that we have an opportunity to uh, g- gain some new listeners, and or maybe just it's a way for somebody who's going to be on a long ride somewhere. You know, if you're a truck driver, hey, you can't beat this system for that, right? Put your phone on speaker or wear yourself a headset. And uh, you can listen to the entire hour and a half show uh, every every day, and every day it's renewed. So, our listen line is provided by a company called Audio Now, who I am extraordinarily grateful to because they don't charge us for it and they don't charge you for it. And in fact, they're paid by the telecommunications companies themselves. I guess to get you to use more minutes. But the beautiful part is it costs us nothing, and there's no strings attached to it. They don't monitor what I say. They don't try to censor it. I'm really thrilled and thankful for the folks over at Audio Now. So um, use that phone line. It's 415-325-0725. If you'd like to communicate with us during the course of the show, you can feel free to do that. 417-204-5141. 417-204-5141. That's our hotline to, to dial into the show. And if you'd just like to call uh, AVN and leave us a message on our message line, you can do that also by calling 417-204-5130. That's our hotline, but it's a message line only. I don't answer that phone. You can always email me, and I do get my email every day. I get hundreds of them a day. And so I do want to hear from you. But I want to hear from you. I don't want to hear, don't send me a link and say, here, read this and you'll know what I think. Eh, wrong thing. Wrong guy. I want you to tell me what you think in your own words. Don't send me a link to a YouTube video and say, here, go watch this and you'll know exactly what I think. Or go watch this and then go do a story on it. If you think that that's such an important issue that a story should be done on it, send me an email and say, I'd like you to show me how to do my own podcast or my own YouTube videos or my own radio program. That I'll help you with. But don't send me an article and tell me that I should go do a story on it. If you think it's that important, you do a story on it. So, email me at mike at americasvoicenow.org. And when you've got an idea or an opinion or a thought or a, or a creative concept, or even if it's negative uh, feedback, I'm okay with that. I, I, I take constructive criticism, and some of the email I get isn't always constructive. Trust me. If you don't like what I talk about or you do, I want to hear about it. And you can email me at mike at americasvoicenow.org. If you've got suggestions for improvements to the show, I'm wide open to that. I'm not a closed-minded guy, and I know I'm far from perfect. And I know I'm not some professional broadcaster like Rush Limbaugh or somebody who's been doing this for 30 years and blah, 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 blah. That ain't me. I just call the shots the way I see them. Some people like it. Some people don't. If you don't, I can't help you. If you've got a good idea about how I can improve it, if you'd like to help us and support us in some way, I'd love to have that. One thing we are trying to do is to transcribe all of our radio programs into text. And uh, YouTube actually does, does a lot of it for you, but we need people to go in there and edit and clean up the text. And so what I do with some other listeners is I share a Dropbox with them. They get some file, they get, the, they, they get the transcription off YouTube, and then they just go in and put punctuation in and clean it up. 
the goal, of course, is for us to be able to take this and compile a book together that we can use to uh, help further our, our dis discussions with folks in education. And also because we're using it to compile a series of articles about how things have progressed over time. So, you know, since we've been talking about Obamacare since 2010, let's take a timeline of what we've covered over that period of time and make sure that we're educating everybody about what's really happened over the period of time. And we can look back at the transcripts of what we talked about during the course of that period. We can also use it for our video, uh, you know, for our video programming as well. If you'd like to help, send me an email. Please put in the subject line what you want to talk about just so I can filter through the tons of other junk and links and all of the other nonsense people send me. Please do not put chain mail me. I don't like it. I don't want it. And you're just clogging up my email box. And I don't read them. I just delete them. If you put me on a chain mail, I delete them. I do not read them. One, I don't want to be affiliated with a chain mail system. Two, more than likely, you've included my email address openly for thousands of other people to see. And I don't like it, and I'm very unhappy that you've done that to me. Thirdly, most of the time, those chain mails, and if you pass this on, you'll get a special blessing, or if you pass this on, you're showing your true patriot. Let me tell you something. I don't need to show my true patriotism by sending on a chain email. And you don't either. The truth of the matter is, you'd do far better to write your own article and then send it out. Or ask me to publish it. Or if not me, somebody else. The truth is, you know, that's plagiarism, not creative work. So, and if I've offended you in any way because you're one of those chain mail people that sends me, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to. I'm just telling you that I get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails a day, and I don't have the time to read these chains. And I really don't care. I don't want to read them. That's just another form of propaganda, folks. And if you look at it intellectually, honestly, you'll recognize that. Okay. Eight million patriots are on an enemies list. There's a system the government's been using since the 1980s. It's called Main Corps. This is new to you. Well, it should come as no surprise. Maybe you just don't know the details. Many of you probably think this system's been out there, and it has. But it's called Main Corps. And it contains the names of people who the government considers to be a threat, quote unquote. These are the people who, in the event of a suspension of, of law or martial law, the implementation of martial law in an, in an emergency, these people would be the first to be tracked down, detained, questioned, and basically targeted for indefinite detention under the National Defense Authorization Act because they are labeled as a threat. Now, this was originally started in the 80s under a continuity of government concept. And the idea was that, you know, in the event that there was a national emergency and they suspended the Constitution and implemented martial law, what would have to happen? Well, the first thing they want to do is get all of those people out of the way who basically are the people guilty of sedition, right? And this is what I was talking about in the last segment under the enemy list. You're considered to be seditious if you speak out against the people in power. And, you know, the criteria for being placed on this list is very, very vague. They won't tell you what it is. They won't identify who, who makes the list or who chooses it. They won't say, well, you know, the military's got a list because, you know, of these people and the administration's got a list of these people. They don't tell us. We do know the system exists. We just don't know who's on it. And this is, we, we, we don't even know what the criteria is for a quote-unquote national emergency. I mean, it doesn't have to be a, a declaration of martial law, ladies and gentlemen. And under the National Defense Authorization Act of 2012, 2013, and now 2014, <coughs> excuse me, they have the method and the means to be able to track you, identify you, locate you, and snatch you, and hold you indefinitely. We don't know what any of the criteria is or who's on the list. So there's no way to get off of it, even because there's no way to know that you're on it. 
When we're talking 8 million people, though, I want you to understand the implications of that. Because when you're talking 8 million people, you know, that is almost 3% of the national population. Now think about that for a minute. You mean to tell me that the federal government has almost 3%, and, and we only know the number to be approximately 8 million. It could be 20 million. Heck, we don't know. But think about this for a minute. 3% of the entire population are considered undesirables. Insurgents. Belligerent actors. Why? We don't know. Is it because you spoke out? Did you commit a crime that they, that they consider to be one that puts you in a, in a high position of, of, or high risk of, of uh, you know, causing damage later? You know, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I get it. If you were a guy, all right, so let's use an example here. I can understand having a guy like, um, what the heck was his name, Kaminsky or whatever that bomber was that they caught living in a cabin out in the middle of Montana or something. I can understand if you were that guy and you got out of prison and you had special bomb making skills and you'd shown the ability and the affinity to already use them that they might want to keep track of you. I understand that. On the flip side of the fence, we don't have 8 million of those people running around the country, ladies and gentlemen. There ain't no way. We'd be lucky to have a couple of thousand people like that running around the country. Now, is the rest of the 8 million guys who um, have military experience, who know how to be, uh, you know, who might know how to, how to manufacture weapons or have special skills that the government doesn't want the rest of us to know? I don't know. Or is it just dissidents like me who speak out freely and, and, and without regard to their own personal safety because my life is really not worth allowing our country to slide under the surface and drown in tyranny and betrayal. You know, personally, I never served in the military. And I regret it. I've regretted it all my life. When I was young, I was stupid. I was more interested in chasing girls and stuff like that. And I wasn't interested in, in, in joining the military. It wasn't that I didn't have a love for my country. I was just more interested in having a good time. And I considered the military to be, you know, a limiting factor in that, Right? But as I got older, and once I got into my late 20s, I wanted to join the military, but they wouldn't have me. I wore glasses, and I, you know, they, 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 they wouldn't let me fly, and so forth and so Anyway, the upshot is, I never served military service. Now, on the other side of the fence, I'm doing military service right now. Because I consider what I'm doing to be a service to my nation. Not to the government, but to the citizenry and the populace. I know for a fact that this program has had an effect on waking individuals up. I know for a fact that there are a group of individuals who have become active and have gone out and made a difference in other people's lives and wakened others as a result of America's Voice Now. I know that I've had a, I've had a valuable effect, a tangible effect, in changing people's outlooks and viewpoints and bringing them out of the slumber of, you know, uh, apathy in many cases or just lack of knowledge. And so I know that I'm technically considered a threat. Am I a big enough threat to be one of the 8 million? I don't know. Here's a senior government official. Here's what he has to say about this. Um, well, first of all, the article says the criteria for being placed on the list is loose, as is the criteria for a national emergency. However, government sources have said that if you're on the list, that you can plan on being detained should martial law be declared. Whoa. A senior government official who served with five administrations. Now, let's, let's understand that, folks. If you've served with five administrations, that means you've been doing this for at least 20 years, right? A senior government official who served with five administrations said that there exists a database of Americans who often, for the slightest 
and most trivial reason are considered unfriendly and who, in a time of panic, might be incarcerated. The database can identify and locate perceived enemies of the state almost instantaneously. Wow. I'm going to read that to you again because I want that to sink in. There exists a database of Americans who often, for the slightest and most trivial reason, are considered unfriendly and who, in a time of panic, might be incarcerated. The database can identify and locate perceived enemies of the state almost instantaneously. Um, Here is your personal tracking device that enables them to identify and locate you instantaneously. Not to mention the fact that if you're on that database with the NSA and the FBI's capabilities to tap into all of our lives, you can bet that all of your internet traffic is monitored, your phone calls are all monitored with intent, not, you know, in a sweep. That your movements and your personal purchases, your credit card application, you know, your pre- credit card purchasing and all the rest of that is all tracked so that they have a they have a pattern of your movements, of your activities. They know who you are, where you go, where you go to church, where you go to school. They know where you work. I want you to understand something. In World War II, the Japanese, not and others, Germans too, but Japanese in particular, were herded up. Their properties were taken from them. They were, they were imprisoned for years in camps. And it's turned, you know, as time has gone on, we've recognized it to be one of the most shameful periods in American history for the mistreatment of a segment of our population. It's no different, ladies and gentlemen, than what Nazi Germany did, with the exception that we didn't gas them and cook them. But we stole their their personal uh, property as a country. Our government took their personal property, bundled them up, trundled them up, and threw them in a, in a, in a, in a concentration camp. You can call it whatever you want. You know, they, they like to use the, the word internment camp. This wasn't an internment camp. It was a concentration camp. They didn't have freedom of movement. They didn't have freedom of thought, freedom of speech. They didn't have any of the rights that you would have under the Bill of Rights. And there were nowhere near 8 million of them. I don't remember the exact numbers. A couple hundred thousand. Folks, we're talking about, at best, 8 million Americans who have been identified, pre-marked, pre-targeted, to be snatched off the street under the authorization of the 2012, 2013, and 2014 and the Patriot Act, National Defense Authorization Actions, and the Patriot Act itself. Now, this program's been around since the 80s. So some of you are saying, that some of the, you that have been longtime you know, political uh, warriors, you're saying, why is he talking about this now? I mean, this isn't news to me. Well, guess what? This show aims to educate the newly awakened as well as the long-awakened and quite haggard. (laughs) So, bear with it. This program's been around since the 80s. That's a long time, folks. We're talking 35 years. And so, we can't help but consider how many times has it been used? I gotta wonder... Are there Americans that have already disappeared? Ask yourself that question. Has it expanded since 9-11? Or was it always 8 million? Is it really only 8 million? Or is it 18 million? You know, 
was at eight million and it's now seven and a half million because already half a million people have been taken out of the mix. Do we have people being held right now under the National Defense Authorization Act? The government won't tell us. That are being held indefinitely until the end of hostilities because they've committed a belligerent act. I hate that quote thing, but I'm trying to impress the point, especially if you're watching it on video. You see, if you're one of the domestic terrorists as labeled by our government you're on the list we don't know how you got there we don't know what they're using as the justification to think you're one of them but we've seen ample evidence that they consider people who are politically active people that are involved in the 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 uh, outspoken militia movements which are lawful We've seen them label religious groups, including specifically Christians. How is it that the Muslims seem to get a free hand on all this stuff? And yet, if you're if you're a Christian, you're labeled uh, as a domestic terrorist. People who have spoken out vociferously against abortion. In other words, the anti-abortion crowd who have been active members and, 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 you know, vocal We've seen these lists before, people. I mean, this isn't something new. I mean, we've seen official lists that said if you had a Ron Paul bumper sticker or you were the guy who was walking around handing out pocket constitutions, you're considered an enemy of the state. You've got to be kidding me. The DHS has got a terrorist list, domestic terrorist list. And conservative thinking... And speech puts you on that list. Is it really only 8 million? I'm sure there's more than 8 million of us out there. The FBI has their own list. The NSA has their list. The question is, ladies and gentlemen, and I want you to read this article because it's full of information. There's a video tied to it, too. Okay, we're going to wrap the show for the day. Before I go, I just got to uh, thank our sponsors. Um, They're the ones who keep us on the air. And so please make sure that you patronize them and support them in any way, shape, or form, big or small. These people have stepped up to the plate and said, I'm going to do my part for liberty and freedom. And I got to tell you, I'm, I'm touched by that. I mean, half of these people know that, you know, our listening audience is nationwide and can't really go in and go get a haircut from Jason at Wit, you know, Wits End. I got to tell you, that, that's an impressive thing for him to do that. So make sure that you go visit Wits End Classic Barbershop if you can. And if you can't, you know, go onto his Facebook page and at least like it. You can find it at Wits End Classic Barbershop right after Facebook.com. Um, go in there and get yourself a haircut. It's 10 bucks, And uh, he does a great job. And you'll meet other great like-minded folks there. Make sure that you, while you're there, you slip into the Patriot Cigar and Tobacco Shop right behind there. And if you want to call them, they ship nationwide. And they have an awesome selection. I mean, they got so many cigars in there. I never knew so many ex- cigars existed. <laughs> and they got, you know, probably a couple of hundred pipes in there. Uh, all the different variants. I don't like a pipe, but, you know, I, I've never, I'm stunned at how many there are. They've got tobacco and tins and bags and, oh my goodness, every accessory you can imagine. Uh, you can reach them at 417-257-1776. Jason Henry, who's over on the Square in West Plains, if you've got a federal or state criminal case that you need help with, he can certainly help you with that. Does family law as well. 417-256-4100. Make sure that you visit our friends at Pizza Hut uh, on Porter Wagoner Boulevard. And uh, Tuesday night, kids eat free. It's family night. And then the battery station, of course. Uh, You can go to the battery station at batterystation.com. You can call them at 417-257-7799, or you can visit them at 303 Washington Avenue in West Plains. If you're interested in building a website or doing any kind of Internet work, you can certainly email me. I run a company called airbridgeweb.com. See you tomorrow.